Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, talk on uh, the International Aviation Software Summit. Uh, very happy to be here. My name is John Manorino. I'll be talking about the challenges for first-time applicants in the, in the world of embedded software. So first, a thank you to RTCA and you're okay for putting this virtual event together and for uh, giving us an opportunity to speak. Um, so we, I will be talking about some top level challenges that we see often with first time applicants. So companies applying for certification for the first time that are doing embedded software that need to comply with the objectives of DO-178, ED-12C. Um, as I said before, I'm John Manorino. I'm the president of Manorino Systems and Software. I've been uh, doing this for over 20 years now uh, as part of my own company. Um, the company provides uh, engineering services to the aerospace industry. Uh, the bread and butter of our services over 20 years has been doing DO-178 software, all design assurance levels, huge OEMs, first-time applicants, small companies, a lot of folks in the urban air mobility these days that are doing wonderful things with drones and then electric engines and with eVTOL. So uh, we've put together a few slides here with the help of uh, the team back at the office. Um, and I'm gonna be talking about some common challenges that we see uh, for organizations as they embrace down this path. Um, there's a few, they're not exactly uh, numbered here in the order of, uh, you know, how much uh, effort or cost or schedule they will cost you. But uh, I figured, let me start with the software one since we're talking about embedded software. Um, first, you know, the first thing I want to point out is just transitioning from, from essentially rapid prototype code to the software that can be so-called certified or, you know, more appropriately approved for a given installation. Um, it's, it's a very different world when you're trying to get software approved on an aircraft per the guidance of the aerospace industry. Um, when you don't have to do that, uh, there's a lot of things that happen with the code. You're, you may be using a lot of commercial off-the-shelf components. You, you may not be as diligent cleaning up your code um, and, and having everything in there that, that you may need to have. Um, so there's, you know, there's something you do for, for rapid prototyping to for proof of concept, and it's something completely different to get that software actually approved. Now, no matter how you started on your project, at the end of the day, you will have to meet all the objectives for your software design assurance level. Um, as you know, any, anyone knows who's picked up the, the documents before, DO-178 or ED-12C, um, the amount of objectives that you have to comply to vary per design assurance level, uh, DALA being the most stringent. And uh, again, independent of what your path to certification, for your given DAL, you will have to meet all the objectives. And those objectives will apply to things like, uh, you know, software requirements, high level, low level, architecture definition, uh, code coverage, traceability. There's a lot of hoops you got to jump through to, to, to convince the aerospace community that your code is safe. So count on restructuring uh, your software to a given extent, depending on the DAL assurance level, maybe less restructuring for DAL D, a heck of a lot more for DAL A. You'll probably have to revisit everything that you've done in terms of commercial off-the-shelf components. Uh, typically, you know, maybe drivers that you've obtained from various sources, uh, real-time executives or operating systems are also commonly taken off the shelf or open source, but uh, you may need to revisit that. You probably will need to revisit that for DAL A, B, and C for sure. Um, in terms of re-architecting your software, I mean, obviously you're gonna have to meet all your technical performance requirements, but you also have to, have to like re-architect it to comply with all your objectives and also to minimize cost. So you, you may have to strip out things like dead code, unnecessary code, some debug code that you had in there. Um, and, and you'll have to fully test it to make sure you comply with all the objectives as well. And, and it'll be a balance here, here in terms of cost. I mean, you'll quickly learn that every line of code will cost you money to put in place the appropriate requirements and lifecycle data that you need. So you'll definitely be trying to minimize code uh, along your process here. And uh, at the same time, as I said, uh, you know, making sure you meet all your performance requirements and, and functional requirements of, uh, of the software. Item number two, which in my mind is probably bigger than number one, and it's where a lot of organizations will get hung up, is it's really an, um, 
an organization culture change to do embedded software to DO-178. Um, it's, it's, it's a mindset that you'll have to embrace within the organization and within engineering and within all the relevant branches, software systems, safety, hardware. Um, you really have to develop a safety oriented culture if you're going to do this right. And if you're going to actually convince a certain authority that you're doing it right and producing safe software and, and that safety oriented culture means that you are going to define clear, succinct, complete engineering processes, and you're going to follow them uh, religiously or, 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 you know, extremely tightly, maybe is a better term. Um, that's what's expected in, in, in aerospace to, to get through your CERT audits and to get certification approval. And that's not a small shift in mentality for organization. Uh, if you've never certified software before, you're going to be used to a much more rapid kind of pace of change in software. You're going to be used to not generating all the what we call life cycle data. Uh, requirements, build documents, test procedures, all the things that you need for a CERT program. Um, you're going to be transitioning from a rapid prototype to a formal process. And all of this needs to be embraced and dealt with in a, in a very, um, in, in, in a good way to get through CERT. Um, all your lifecycle data, not just the code, all of it, all of it that's required for your design assurance level, will have to meet certain quality uh, standards and they'll have to be deemed acceptable by the delegates uh, that are performing audits um, and by the cert authorities who will, will be involved. And there will be a lot of lifecycle data that you will need to generate. Plans, processes, standards, a whole variety of checklists are typically used to perform a whole variety of verification tasks primarily, um, but also design tasks. You'll have design data, requirements data, test procedures, test cases, uh, build documents, test reports, configuration management records, quality assurance records. You'll have a whole slew of data that you have to do. It's not new for 178, been there for a heck of a long time, but it may be new to your organization. And you'll have to embrace this. Uh, the organizations who don't embrace this, the seriousness of this, uh, um, uh, of this adherence to process, process and high quality data uh, will struggle. Uh, it is not just the code. The code is a hugely important element of what you're going to generate, but there's a whole package that comes with that, that you need to convince the CERT authorities that the code is safe. Um, so that'll be a big one. Um, I, I guess if I speak a little bit as a president of a company or a project manager of a company, uh, cost will be king. Uh, it'll be huge. The cost to develop 178 software is, is really high compared to a non-178 process. Uh, we work in various industries, even other safety critical industries, and um, they don't compare to the diligence that's required of a 178 program. And with diligence comes cost and man hours and uh, schedule to get it all done. Um, so you really need to understand what you need to do to be compliant. And then you need to craft your program and make decisions carefully to get the job done and minimize your costs. Um, so even if you run your program really efficiently and smartly, uh, it'll be fairly expensive, um, especially when you haven't done this before, the costs may surprise you. But then there'll be a bunch of traps along the way uh, which you can fall into, which will drive your costs even higher and potentially cause more heartache to your program. So lack of certain knowledge in terms of what's expected uh, and by, you know, DO-178, ED-12C is, is huge. Uh, you better understand what you need to generate. Um, poor processes, um, unclear processes, lack of following processes. Uh, will be uh, a really tough one too. You will get caught, uh, you will probably fail audits, and then you'll have the luxury of going back and having to repeat the work and redo audits. And all of that is cost and schedule to your program. Uh, transitioning too early to a formal process uh, could be a problem because you're gonna carry a big formal process from day one. Uh, transitioning too late to a formal process will be a huge challenge because your reverse engineering job is going to be just 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 tremendous. And typically when you leave it to too late, you're typically pushing schedule. You typically have not embraced 
the seriousness of doing this job and you'll probably get caught on audits because the quality of the lifecycle data just won't be good enough. So, um, and you know, I've listed five bullets there. I could probably list 20 or 30 where an organization, a project can get themselves in trouble and drive their costs even higher. So, uh, um, you know, be careful, be knowledgeable and then drive your program properly. Um, and then, you know, we wanted to throw this one in there because uh, it seems maybe a little basic, but we see this every single time with first time applicant, which is a lack of knowledge of what's required uh, for configuration management uh, per the objectives of DO-178. And we see companies getting themselves in all kinds of issues and this causing huge inefficiency. So at a really, really high level, DO-178C has objectives for configuration management. You need clear uh, processes in place for configuration identification of every piece of lifecycle data. Code, executable, requirements, plans, processes, checklists, build documents, test cases, procedures, you name it, you need a clear, way of configuration, identifying every piece of data, including version control. You will need to establish base, the baselines of your lifecycle data at various stages. So the most typical one will be for sure at certification, you'll have a baseline, but that'll be just what you're putting into the field for the first time. You will establish dozens and dozens of baselines along the way and probably hundreds of thousands when you call, count all the individual items. You'll have baselines of plans, baselines of processes, baselines of code, baselines of test cases, baselines of reviews. You need to manage your baselines and, and you know, they're, they're hugely important in 178 because you, you do a bunch, you start with something, you do some formal work on it to advance it, you declare a baseline, and then you track changes from their formal changes so that you can take credit for incremental activity and not have to review uh, um, data from scratch completely every time you make an incremental change. So managing baselines is, uh, is very important. Um, problem reporting. Uh, three and four may be tied together, problem reporting, change control, corrective action, reviews. Um, companies do this in different ways. Sometimes they're more tightly coupled or not, but the basic concept is you will have a formal problem reporting system, something that clearly indicates which artifacts the problem was reported on, what the potential problem is, what the investigation is, what the solution is, what the change impact is to the rest of your program. So you need a good process in place for that. That's, you know, hand in hand, you need a change control process. Once I establish a baseline, uh, you're going to be making many, 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 many changes on your way to certification. You need to clearly be able to identify what is changing, what the impact of that change is, what the old is and what the new is, and make sure that the new has all the proper reviews and, and verification to make sure it's appropriate. You will need to keep track of all this stuff that's through something called configuration status accounting. So you will need to know what state your requirements are in and code and procedures and checklists and reviews and everything else. You'll need a system in place to be able to bookkeep it all it's not exactly rocket science, but it needs to be done in a very diligent, professional, repeatable way so that your program can keep track of things. Um, you will need an archival retrieval and release process. You need to make, you know, you need to understand that your product will typically be in the field for let's say 30 years on an aircraft um, of whatever type it is. And for that whole 30 years, you need to be able to uh, potentially at any point in time, be able to recreate your software build your procedures, your development environment, and make changes to fix a safety issue. So the whole release, archival, um, and retrieval, which all go hand in hand, is kind of like a key part of your CM processes you have to have in place. And, the, and there's a, something called data control categories, which uh, talk about the different types of controls you will need to have over different pieces of life cycle data. Something like a software requirement spec will need one type of control. Something like a quality assurance record will need a different type of control. So these are all things that you need to embrace, put in place in, uh, in, in clear, succinct processes and have the team trained on so that uh, you can just execute your program efficiently. And uh, it's often we see many of the elements there listed one to seven missing on programs. Um, 
And I think that was my last slide. So um, thanks for listening, everyone. Again, I just tried to capture some real high level um, uh, considerations for first time applicants. There are many more to watch out for, uh, but uh, you know, I hope this was helpful to, to all of you. Thank you all.